Hello, everybody, and either welcome or welcome back to my podcast. As always, if you do like this, please rate, comment, and subscribe. You can find me on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, and YouTube. Well, we certainly do not lack for things to talk about in this weekly roundup. So let's go ahead and start kind of where everything left off the last time I recorded. Um, Last Friday, it was, I do believe it was last Friday, that news broke that there was a prostitution sting going down in Florida. Um, Apparently, the Vero, I think it was Vero Beach PD, was doing an undercover operation of massage parlors down there. And I say massage parlors in kind of air quotes, although they were legitimate massage parlors. There were also extra services one could purchase. And in and of itself, it wasn't all that particularly remarkable, except for the fact that one of the men that was charged with receiving sexual services at one of these day spas was one Robert Kraft. Now, if you're not a sportsy type person, Robert Kraft, amongst other things, and yes, being a part of that Kraft family, is the owner of the New England Patriots. So now, obviously, this became a huge story because, obviously, he's very famous, he's very well-known, and so this story got a lot more national attention than it would have if it was just random guys who got caught up in a sting down in Vero Beach. So, how this ended up going down is they had run undercover operations on, I believe it was either three or four different day spas, and what it was initially presented as was that these women that were working in these day spas were the victims of sex trafficking, that they were being trafficked because they are foreign born women from China. So they had come in from China and the evidence that the police gave publicly for their, their assertion that these women are being sexually trafficked is that At the day spas in question, there was a room in the back that had, like, beds set up. And there were kitchens that had food in them. And there was a hot plate. And it was initially presented that these women were trapped in these spas and couldn't leave and were forced to perform services on these men. And, yeah, that's how it was first initially presented. Now... This story unfolded kind of weirdly because it first dropped, like the Robert Kraft angle was the first thing that really dropped, was that he was charged with misdemeanor solicitation of prostitution. And for what it's worth, they seem, they have him on tape, which this is another kind of problem with this case is they did have like surveillance in there. They had tape, they had audio, they had video. And so they caught him on two separate occasions going in there and receiving sexual services for money, whatever. Anyway, so that's the first thing that dropped. And then we kind of got around to this sex trafficking thing. And as, as, as it always seems to be now, it's everything is human trafficking, but we'll get to that in a second. So basically it was first presented as that and as everything kind of developed, well, it turns out that it wasn't quite as initially presented. Now, like I said, when they first presented it, they presented it almost as if these women were like prisoners within these day spas and they were forced to live there and they couldn't leave. And, oh my God, look, they're eating meals here, which I'm like, I I have a job. I eat two of my three meals a day at work. Like, I'm not a trafficked human being. Like, that's not... It's not odd to go to a job and there's a kitchen with food in it and things to cook on. Like, that's pretty standard. Now, as far as the beds in the back and everything, I'm sure that there were women that were actually living there because, like I said, they, they were from China. Like, they're not, they're not native-born. They were foreign-born. So, that was their evidence. So... We go along a little further in the story, and it all kind of falls apart. Um, The police chief goes on television because, of course, of course. And so he's giving interviews, and he accidentally lets slip that these women could have left whenever they wanted to. And he let it slip in in the kind of... The question was, why were these women allowing themselves to be sex trafficked? Which, first and foremost... 
nobody allows themselves to be sex trafficked. Like, like the whole setup was a dumb fucking question. But so the female anchor asked him this question and he said, well, they could have left any time they wanted to. And so we don't know why they stayed. And it's like, dumbass, dumbass. You just completely destroyed your case. Like, are you stupid? But as it turns out, these women were here on work visas. Well, are here on work visas, at least for now. And they did have the proper licensing to be massage therapists in Florida. So this wasn't quite the, the, the shady underground sex trafficking ring that it was initially presented as. But not that that stopped anybody from running with that narrative. And still, probably to this day after it has pretty much been debunked at this point, there are still people out there running with the sex trafficking narrative. And I do think there are some reasons for that. One of which being that, obviously, this whole conflating sex work with sex trafficking thing is becoming a thing, and it is a bit problematic. And another thing that nobody's really talked about, but I think it does bear pointing out I think a lot of people were willing to run with this particular narrative because these are foreign-born Asian women. And so it kind of buys into that Asian sex slave fetish and that kind of mentality that like, if a woman is Asian and she's foreign-born and she's doing sex work that like, it can't be of her own volition. It can't be because she has chosen to do that. It's got to be some kind of weird slavery thing. And like, If that's what you thought, you might need to go sit down with yourself and evaluate your biases about Asian women and sex and sex work, because that was just a little icky, guys. Little icky. So at this point, I think everybody is on board with the fact that this wasn't human trafficking or sex trafficking, or at least everybody who wants to be honest about it. But this is another one of those stories where you got to wait 72 hours. Like, almost like every story that breaks now is like, just wait 72 hours. Then comment. Because it inevitably, inevitably, the first reports are wrong. Like, every time now, like, I don't understand this. Like, how hard is it to get a story right on the first try? I don't, I don't get it. But anyway, at this point, the arrest records are out. Everything's out. And nobody's been arrested for sex trafficking. Nobody's been arrested for forced labor or compelled prostitution or anything that can be construed as human trafficking or sex trafficking. So once again, this is another one of these stories. And this happened in Seattle a couple of years back where it was this big to do and the police made this big bust and it was supposed to be this huge sex trafficking ring and they were just saving all these women and it was just so great and so wonderful and nobody was actually like charged with any kind of trafficking offenses or any kind of forced labor offenses. It basically just ended with garden variety prostitution charges. But to kind of point out two big problems with these sorts of stings, and that is the first thing of the fact that these are undercover stings run by police officers. And this particular one went on for about six months. So what you're telling me is that it took you six months to either get the evidence that you needed to make this case of human trafficking or what probably happened is you decided to let this go on for six months, not because you thought that anybody was in any kind of imminent fucking danger, because obviously if you think actual sex trafficking is happening, you don't let that go on for six months. You go in there as soon as you have evidence that actual sex trafficking is happening. What you do do when you let something go for six months is you get sex acts performed on you on the taxpayer's dime. That's what you do. And it ain't the first time this has happened, and it probably won't be the last time it happens. But yeah, that's, that's a problem. Like, there's no reason for this. There's none whatsoever. The second problem is, is what happens to these women now? Because they are, like I said, they're foreign born. They're here on work visas. So now they have a choice to make. Here's, and here's where... So much goes so wrong. So you're one of these women. You have two choices. You can either lie 
and say that you are a victim of sex trafficking if you're not and throw yourself on the mercy of DHS and hopefully they'll let you stay in the country or you admit that you're not the victim of sex trafficking which means that you are now caught doing a felony offense which is prostitution which automatically starts your deportation procedure proceedings so what do you do I mean, it's pretty obvious you choose door A because you want to stay in this country, but because of this situation and because prostitution is still illegal, it's it's so hard to be able to kind of figure out what the real numbers are on sex trafficking because I'm sure sex trafficking does happen. Like, I'm not saying it never happens. I'm saying that because of this current situation and the choices that are presented to these women, it's really hard to get an accurate number. And it's not just foreign born women who are taught this, like native born women are being taught this too. If you're, if you're caught and you're being charged with prostitution, just say you're being sex trafficked and you can beat the charge. But then now you become part of that statistic of women who are being sex trafficked or men who are being sex trafficked and you're actually not. So it really skews the numbers and it makes it very difficult to address a real problem because you're working with false numbers and you're working with false numbers because the system incentivizes people to say that they are sex trafficked even when they're not because that's an easy way to beat a case. It's an easy way to stay in the country. It's an easy way to stay out of jail. So ultimately what needs to happen is that sex work, prostitution needs to be decriminalized in this country. I know this is like beating a dead horse at this point, but if you really, really, really care about sex trafficking and you really want to put an end to that and you want to put an end to sex workers being in abusive situations, if you want to get them away from abusive pimps, if you want them to be able to be independent contractors or you want them to be able to freely choose where they work and how they work and who they work with, you have to decriminalize prostitution. You have to to make this a way in which they don't have to operate as criminals. Because when you put somebody in that position, that what they're doing for a living is illegal, it's just like dealing drugs. It's like you're automatically shoving people into a much more dangerous situation than what really needs to be. So I know I've seen that it's come down that New York is thinking about decriminalizing prostitution. I hope it happens. I hope it's something that becomes a trend across the country. I'm interested to see, especially with the New York situation, I wonder if the decriminalization of sex work in, by the way, I do advocate decrim versus legalization because A, that is what sex workers prefer, and B, it's something that would make their lives a lot easier versus legalization because once you open it up to legalization, You also open it up to taxation, obviously, but then you also open it up to regulation, which doesn't address the root cause of the problem, which is that the government is telling these people what they can and cannot do with their bodies. Like right now, you're making it illegal for them to sell their bodies. If you legalize it, then you're making it a situation where you have to do all these different things. You have to jump through these different government hoops to get your license and to keep applying for your license. And you've got to, you've got to go here and you got to do this test. You got to do that test. You got to do all these other things. And so it's still the government telling you what you can and cannot do with your body. So that's why they advocate for decrim versus legalization. But it's something that I'm wondering if it will go down kind of the same way that weed legalization has gone down, where it kind of starts on the state level and each state just decides to just go ahead and handle their business outside of what the federal government does and does not decide to do. So it'll be interesting to see how this goes down. But yeah, this whole thing was a total clusterfuck and it just, it highlights a lot of problems that are going on right now, especially for those of us who cover sex workers and sex work and this new conflation with all sex work being like human trafficking, being sex trafficking. And it's just a particularly nasty, nasty trope that's going around. And there's a lot, a lot of people who are buying into it and ignoring what sex workers are actually trying to tell you, which is that we're not trafficked. We are, we are choosing to do this, but there are some people who just dead ass don't want to hear it and want to think that all these people are victims of something and need to be saved despite what sex workers are actually trying to tell them. And so hopefully 
maybe at some point in the future, people will actually start listening to sex workers and start listening to what they're telling you that they want and start taking that seriously and start advocating for them and just to try to make their lives better and try to make it easier because, of course, the government should not be telling these people what they can and cannot do with their bodies. It's their body. It's their business. They have agency. They have self-ownership. If they want to have sex for money, then they should be allowed to fucking have sex for money. Like, this shouldn't even be a problem. This shouldn't even be a thing, but here we are. But anyway, leaving off that because we've still got a bunch of other stuff to talk about. So let's go ahead and move on to the next topic. So the next story that was a story for about 15 minutes before it got pushed out of the news cycle by a whole bunch of other insanity was that a federal judge has ruled in favor of, first of all, a lawsuit that was brought by a men's rights advocacy group that it is unconstitutional for women to be excluded from the draft based on the fact that women are now eligible for active combat roles. So a federal judge ruled in favor of that kind of sort of. It's not something that's going to be implemented right away, if ever, anyway. But it started this whole thing on social media and on the internet of people wanting to try to make this a gendered issue. And especially if you were a woman and you had something to say about this, obviously there are some dumbasses who wanted to make it a point of it being about a gender. And I'm just like, first of all, no. And here's where I think it's so funny that it's a men's rights advocacy group that brought this whole lawsuit. Because first of all, then no, they really don't want women drafted. This is just basically some bullshit gotcha thing. Like, oh, look, you want equality? Here's your equality. How do you like that? It's like, no, you know what you should be advocating for? How about nobody gets drafted? How about that? How about men aren't eligible for the draft anymore? No women, no men, nobody has to be conscripted to go fight in a war for the state. How about that? Yeah, that's a much better stance. Not everybody should be eligible for the draft. It should be that nobody is eligible for the draft, dumbasses. Why is this hard? But of course, there's always people that want to make dumbass arguments. And so I spent a fair amount of time smacking down arguments that, no, this isn't because of my gender. I don't think anybody should be drafted. Like, I don't think it's fair for men to be drafted. I don't think it's fair for women to be drafted. I don't feel like anybody should have to sign up for selective service for any reason that they don't want to. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't understand why this is a difficult stance to take. Like, it's pretty much a no-brainer for me. But as far as the military actually instituting this, um, this particular judgment doesn't mandate that they start doing this. And from what I've read, uh, they're currently doing a study on this particular topic of allowing women into the draft. And the results aren't supposed to be out until March of next year, so March 2020. So... I don't think anything is going to happen between now and March of 2020 as far as women having to sign up for selective service. I don't know. We shall see. But it was just really, it was a stupid story. Like, the whole thing was just stupid. And it's like, if you think that this is a good thing, then, like, you've completely fucking missed the point. Like, nobody should be drafted. Not everybody. Nobody. Should be a no-brainer. But moving on to the rest of the week which kind of pushed everything else out of the news cycle. And we'll go ahead and start with the Trump-Kim Jong-un summit that happened, kind of. They had met over in Vietnam, and this was going on at the same time as the Michael Cohen hearing. So you can kind of guess which one got more press. Like, basically... Everybody covered the Cohen hearing and nobody really covered the the Kim Jong-un and Trump summit, which I guess is just well enough because it seems like I don't know exactly what happened because nobody's really reported on it because, again, everybody was so worried about Michael Cohen and his congressional hearing, whatever. The, The summit got canceled abruptly. Well, not canceled. It got shut down early and Trump came back early with no deal reached. Um, from what I've seen, it seems like the hangup was on sanctions. And so I'm not entirely sure what happened, but yeah, everything kind of ended abruptly. Everything just got kind of broken off. Trump came home and nobody's talked about it. 
Like, okay. Seems like that was a newsy thing. That, first of all, this summit happened again in the first place. And that it was cut off abruptly. And there was no deal. Like, okay, can, can somebody go look into that? See exactly what happened? Because that's kind of a big deal. Kind of more of a big deal than what Michael Cohen had to say. But one thing that was reported out of this and Trump, of course, of course, Trump said a dumbass thing because he's Trump. He said, because somebody asked him about, about Otto Warmbrenner, he said that Kim Jong-un told him that he didn't know anything about it. And Trump trusted him and took him at his word, which, <sighs> God damn it. Like this, this summit was kind of a fail on all fronts from everything I can see, but that, that's just fucking stupid. Like there's no way an American gets picked up, tortured and sent back to the U S in a coma without Kim Jong-un's approval, or at least knowledge about it. That's not how North Korea works. People aren't out there just roguely picking up Americans and beating the shit out of them. Not without his approval, because obviously you don't do anything in that country without his approval. That's how North Korea works. Did nobody fucking tell him this? Like, he's a dictator. His whole family. Family of dictators. You don't do shit in North Korea without him knowing about it. So, yeah, it just... It, it, Trump is not exactly the smartest man on the planet. Let's put it that way. But that was pretty damn dumb. Like, come on, man. Like, you really? Like, I, I know you want to be the little fat rocket man's friend and everything. But don't let somebody piss on your head and tell you it's rain, dude. Like, everybody knows what happened. Everybody knows that Kim Jong-un knew about it. Whatever the hell it was that happened. So let's let's not pretend. Like, that's just... I don't, I don't understand this man sometimes, aside from the fact that he's like mentally a five-year-old. But moving on to the thing that everybody did cover, which was the Michael Cohen hearing, which I managed to watch a good chunk of that live. And just every time I watch a congressional hearing live, I tell myself, I'm like, this is the last time I'm doing this. This is the last time I'm doing this to myself. I'm not watching any more congressional hearings live. But I keep doing it because apparently this is my life now. So watch this hearing and really the big takeaway, honestly, is in relationship to the BuzzFeed piece that I know I've talked about plenty of times on the show, but Michael Cohen in his opening statements point blank said that Donald Trump never explicitly told him to lie to Congress. Now, what Michael Cohen did say was that there was kind of a wink, wink, nudge, nudge situation going on where it's like, well, he didn't specifically say it to me, but he was kind of talking in code. And I can decipher the code because I've been around him for long enough. So I understood what he was telling me to do, but he didn't specifically tell me to do the thing, which in all honesty, sure, that might have happened. However, that does not rise to the standard that either the BuzzFeed piece put out because they specifically said that they saw proof or one of them saw proof or none of them saw proof. Again, who the fuck knows at this point, but they ran the story as saying that they had proof that Trump explicitly told Cohen to lie to Congress in his original congressional testimony, which apparently is not true, much like the Mueller's office said. So, but they're still sticking with the story. Like, it's so wild. It's, it's so nuts to watch people still defend this story. And even it broke last night which this should tell you everything you need to know about the interview was that it was dropped on a Saturday night. Somebody from the New Yorker interviewed Comier and it's just, it's such a fucking disaster of an interview. I feel bad for the dude. I feel bad for the interviewer because it's obvious that Comier has nothing to say or add to the conversation and didn't really want to answer any questions about anything. But so that was kind of the big takeaway. There was plenty of other shit going on. And of course, of course, like two thirds of it was congressional grandstanding and either yelling at Cohen or trying to prop up Cohen. And it's just like, does anybody take any of this seriously? Like, are you kidding me? Like, I, I lost count of how many times people mentioned Cohen getting a book deal or a TV deal or a movie deal. And I'm like, aren't, aren't we here to figure out, like, 
whether Trump has colluded with Russia or whether there's there's something nefarious going on. Like, I don't. Why why are you questioning him about book deals? Why are you yelling at him about lying before? Like, OK, yeah, he lied in his original testimony. He's been charged with it. He's going to go to jail for it. Do we really need to keep bringing it up every time somebody gets in front of a mic? Like, everybody already knows this. But, of course, just Congress being Congress, everybody has to be a grandstanding jackass, so. But the fact that we're even here and having to have this conversation about Michael Cohen, it's just emblematic of what happens when you have a president that surrounds himself with trash people, which Trump has. Like, I've lost count of how many people have charges or indictments and where they have them and what they have them for and who's going to jail and who's going to trial. And I've I've lost count, which is kind of not a good thing when you're talking about associates of the president of the United States. Like, you shouldn't have to, like, have a flow chart to figure out which one of his associates is going to jail or not. But... Again, this is what happens when you elect somebody like Trump. Like, this is who he's always been. Like, he's always surrounded himself with these trash people. And now we have to, like, deal with all these trash people. And I guess so much for draining the swamp. I mean, this is... You just brought the New York City swamp down to D.C. is basically what happened. So, anyway, those hearings are over now. Like I said, nothing of real substance was learned I'm not even entirely sure what the congressional hearing was supposed to reveal. I don't know what it's supposed to be for, which is how I feel after every time I watch a congressional hearing. I was like, what the fuck was that for? Why did I watch that? Why do I keep doing that to myself? But I know I will. I know I will. There will be another hearings and I will watch those too. So before we wrap this up, CPAC happened this weekend started Friday, finished up, I believe, today. This is Sunday. And yeah, okay, CPAC happened. And obviously, the, the usual grifters showed up, as, as always. You know, the Charlie Kirks and the Candace Owens and Jacob Wall was there and all the other grifters were there. But Trump showed up. And he wasn't on the official schedule, although I'm sure the CPAC organizers knew he was showing up because obviously he's president of the United States now. He can't just show up places like you have to do all this planning and stuff. So anyway, he shows up yesterday and gives a two hour speech. Now, think about all the insane shit that would come out of Donald Trump's mouth if you sat him down for two hours in front of a hot mic. That's what that speech was yesterday. And I don't think it was broadcast anywhere, but there was a lot of people live tweeting it. And there was just like insane, crazy shit coming out of this man's mouth. Like it was so beyond, like just it's exactly what you would imagine it would be. Just two hours of Donald Trump just spewing verbal diarrhea and people clapping for it, which makes him just spew more verbal diarrhea because that's all the man wants. It's like as long as you clap for whatever he says, he's just going to keep doubling and tripling, quadrupling down on it because he wants the applause. But anyway... One thing that did come out of the speech that will be interesting to see how this unfolds is he said that he will be issuing an executive order requiring universities that receive federal funding to support free speech. Now, what will this look like? Nobody quite knows yet. Um, Robbie Suave reported today that according to an official that he spoke to, there is an actual draft of this EO, but nobody quite knows what's in it yet, so... This will be a topic that we will have to come back to once the EO is made public, or at least a draft of it, because here's my question. Okay, he could technically EO this, and you wouldn't run across a 1A issue because it's not Congress. Here's my question. Okay, so you you sign this executive order that universities who are federally funded have to support free speech. First of all, what do you mean by that? Like, what... Like, what is going to be the criteria for determining if they support free speech or not? Second of all, how are you going to enforce it? And here's here's my question. And this comes down to the enforcement part. Like, okay, if you're going to make this a rule and there's going to be an enforcement arm of it, I would think that you would then have to go through Congress and make a law to enforce this 
which obviously, once you start doing that, now you do have a 1A issue because Congress cannot make laws about free speech. So, I'm very interested to see exactly what the verbiage of this EO is and exactly what they plan on doing as far as enforcing the EO. But before we leave off on this, I want to leave on some some stupid petty Twitter drama that happened with CPAC, and that is with, okay, so the bulwark. It's Bill Crystal's and Charlie Sykes' new platform, basically meant as a replacement for the Weekly Standard that got shut down. So, obviously, if you know anything about Weekly Standard, you know anything about Bill Crystal, you know anything about Charlie Sykes, they're never Trumpers. And Weekly Standard was kind of a never Trump platform. So, they send Molly Zhang Fast to go cover CPAC, like as one of their official correspondents. Now, Molly is not a conservative. Molly is a liberal. Molly tweeted things making fun of a pro-life panel and half of political Twitter lost their shit. And it was just, it was just the stupidest, dumbest, pettiest Twitter drama because people were wanting to come at Crystal and wanting to come at the bulwark for... Apparently their tagline is conserving conservatism, which what what is conservatism anymore? But anyway, so people were wanting to attack them for sending her to go cover this because they're supposed to be a conservative outlet. And why are you sending a correspondent who's making fun of pro-life people, which, okay, here's my thing. If you already know that Bill Crystal and Charlie Sykes are never Trumpers, and you kind of understand what Bulwark is supposed to be for, sending Molly was basically a big middle finger to the CPAC crowd, and that's what it was intended to be. Like, we think so little of you that we're just going to send a liberal liberal to cover you. Like, that was kind of the meta joke. But so many people got so pissed off about it, and then people got pissed off about people being pissed off about it. Anyway, this whole Tempest in a Teapot kind of revealed that there's an interesting schism going on in the conservative movement, whatever the hell the conservative movement is anymore. Like, can somebody please define conservatism for me? Because I have no fucking clue what that word means anymore. Like, what is conservatism now? Because, I mean, as much of a shit show as CPAC is and has become over the past, I don't know, five-ish years, maybe a little less, maybe a little more, it is the conservative conference of note in this country. It's pretty much the premier conservative conference every year. And so while it's it's tempting to dismiss what happens at CPAC, you can't really dismiss what happens at CPAC because that's supposed to be the conservative conference. And so if I am to gather that conservatism is what is on display at CPAC, I don't know what it is outside of trolling and owning the lips. Like, that's it. Like, I don't, like, there's no other policy. There's no foreign policy. There's no domestic policy. There's no fiscal policy coming out of this. It's just basically being dickheads on social media, which that's not a fucking movement. So I don't know what conservatism is anymore. Aside from basically just being a bunch of trolls being led by the troll in chief and I mean, there's no future in that, but the idea, going back to the bulwark of conserving conservatism, like, okay, well, what the fuck are you conserving? There's there's nothing left. It's all gone. The the carcass has been picked clean. And this whole kerfuffle shows that there is this weird schism between the pro-Trumpers, the never-Trumpers, And the people that are kind of over here that aren't pro-Trump, but they're not part of that never-Trump, let's-go-troll-the-pro-Trump crowd, who seem to want something, but I'm not entirely sure what it is. And I'm interested to see what happens with that particular group of people, because as far as I can see, and this is my prediction, whether Trump wins in 2020 or not, the GOP conservatism, whatever, does not come back from this era. Like, you're done. You're, you're fucked. Like, you, if you've gone all in on Trump. And judging from what I saw at CPAC, 
conservatism has gone all in on Trumpism. Like, Trumpism is conservatism now, as far as I can tell. It, like I said, if somebody knows different, please let me know. But I don't know what what happens to those people. Where do they go? Because it's, the GOP is never going to be their home again. And I think they are starting to realize that. So I'm very fascinated. Like, I know Jonah Goldberg is opening up his own center-right platform with somebody else who's, I can't remember. I'm so sorry. I should have wrote it down. But they're opening that. And there's a lot of other kind of conservatarianisms kind of floating around out there. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering if these people will eventually find a home in libertarianism. Like, like you, you kind of start out being a, a GOP orphan and then you become a conservatarian and then you kind of become a libertarian. I'm wondering if that shift will happen. I wonder if these people will actually be willing to take that step of like openly identifying as libertarians, because as far as I can tell, there's no other home for these people anymore. Like they're just, they're just orphans right now. Like they can't go to the GOP. Obviously Democrats are not going to be hospitable to them. However much that the Max Boots and Tom Nichols of the world try to ingratiate themselves to Democrats, like they're never going to accept you. So you can come join us. You can come be part of our house. We're fun. We're nice people. Hi. But yeah, like I said, I wonder, I'm very interested to see what happens over the next couple of years. Because like I said, like, I don't see how, like, I don't see how the GOP brings itself back anywhere close to the center, or at least enough for the center right people to feel comfortable calling themselves Republicans again. So it's going to be a very interesting time. And I, I think that that same argument could also be made about center left people, but that's kind of beyond what we're talking about right now. But yeah, I want to leave off on that note because I'm I'm curious. I'm going to I'm going to keep an eye on these people and see kind of where the winds blow them. But as always, if you did make it this far, thank you for listening. And if you do like this, please rate, comment and subscribe. You can find me on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify and YouTube. Take care and until next time.